Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I just want a show of hands. How many folks actually treat head and neck cancer in the audience? Oh, good deal, okay. As you can imagine, that's not always a high number. Um, so, I have uh, research support from both Merck and Pfizer. The outline for the talk is I'm gonna talk about a radiosensitizer winner um, for HPV-mediated oropharynx cancer. That was a big update late last year. I'm also gonna talk about a practice-changing update for recurrent metastatic squamous cell carcinomas of the head and neck. I'm gonna spend just a few moments talking about noteworthy negative studies. I think that's important. We put a lot of patients on trials uh, that end up turning out to be negative, and then we do subsequent studies that are also negative, so it's important that we be mindful of that. And then some treatment updates in non-squamous head and neck cancers. So first question, and I made some last minute updates so that we won't have the electronic option, so I'll just have to do a show of hands. But for the first question, it's a 58-year-old male. He has a local regionally advanced HPV-associated tonsil cancer. He's got excellent performance status and no contraindications to platinum. So he's going to get definitive chemo radiation potentially. What radio sensitizer would you add? How many folks would do bolus cisplatin? Okay. How many would do cetuximab? Does anyone think that the patient should not get a radio sensitizer? Good, no hands up. And does anyone feel that cisplatin or cetuximab are interchangeable and you'd give either or? Okay. The second question is a 64-year-old healthy man with HPV-mediated tonsil squame. This time it's metastatic. He has an excellent performance status, no medical comorbidities, and good organ function. His CPS score is at least one. What would you recommend as first-line treatment for his cancer? How many would give extreme? Anybody willing to give Pembro monotherapy or Pembro plus chemo as first line? Anybody going to give methotrexate? And anyone giving Derva plus Tremi? Okay, so nobody raised their hands. So apparently this gentleman's going on hospice. Okay. <laughs> we'll talk about the correct answers later in the talk. So the first major update or highlight that I want to touch on is in the curative intent setting. So this is for HPV-mediated oropharynx cancer. As many of you are aware, cancers of the oropharynx due to HPV represent both biologically and clinically distinct entities. And as a result, these folks tend to do better. They have a better chance of survival and are more likely to live longer with substantial toxicity. As a result, there have been many uh, questions asked about, can we de-intensify therapy in these patients? And so this question was posed in the RTOG 1016 cooperative study, where they were really looking to see, can we substitute uh, cetuximab for cisplatin as the radio sensitizer? And so in this study, patients had to have P16 positive uh, oropharynx cancer. They were stratified based on stage, uh, T-stage, nodal stage, performance status, as well as smoking history. And they were randomized to either receive the control arm, which in this case was accelerated fractionation radiation with two cycles of bolus cisplatin. And just as a reminder, accelerated radiation with two cycles of bolus is comparable to standard fractionation with three cycles of bolus cisplatin. So they chose to do accelerated plus two cycles of bolus or to do accelerated radiation with cetuximab instead. And so this is the uh, important slide to look at, which shows that at five years out from treatment, cisplatin was shown to be superior to cetuximab with respect to overall survival, PFS, and local regional failure. And all of this was statistically significant. Now, I will tell you that there was a lot of controversy about this trial, even in its genesis, because people felt that there would be too few events for this to ever report out. And really, was this a question worth asking? What I will tell you is that 
While many times folks will say, who cares what the radio sensitizer is? The radio sensitizer is only a modest component of the survival and control benefit. Um, this study challenges that dogma. So it was clear that uh, uh, cetuximab was not non-inferior. In fact, it was inferior to cisplatin. Um, and while, in, while cisplatin had more acute toxicity, the late toxicity was not significantly different. So the authors concluded that this trial was the first to establish a standard of care in HPV-related oropharynx cancer and that accelerated radiation with bolus cisplatin for two cycles was acceptable. Most of the time, folks are still doing standard fractionation with three cycles, and again, that's, that's considered comparable. So takeaway from this study was that you should not just interchangeably be switching cetuximab for cisplatin. In an HPV-mediated population, you still need to give cisplatin, preferably bolus. So now we'll move on to the recurrent metastatic setting. So a few years ago, we really only had a few established standards for incurable head and neck cancer. First line was the extreme regimen, which unfortunately holds true to his name with respect to toxicity. And second line, we had either monotherapy with cetuximab or monotherapy with a PD-1 uh, inhibitor. What this study was looking at now is can immunotherapy go head to head in the first line metastatic setting for uh, squamous cell carcinoma uh, against the standard gold standard, which is the extreme regimen. So the initial results of the interim analysis, the second interim analysis were presented at ESMO. Um, this was the protocol specified final result, results given at ASCO uh, in last month. So I'll touch on both. So for this trial, patients had to have recurrent or metastatic disease. They had to have squame of the oropharynx, oral cavity, hypopharynx, or larynx. They had to have a good performance status as well as tissue samples available for PDL1 testing. And then they were stratified uh, based on their PDL1 expression as well as P16 status and their performance status. Patients were randomized one to one to one. So they either got the gold standard, which is the extreme regimen, which is the, the bottom, uh, bottom column here, or they got randomized to pembrolizumab as monotherapy or pembrolizumab plus chemotherapy, where the chemotherapy was a platinum and 5-FU backbone. So these first slides are looking at overall survival, which was the primary endpoint, and it's looking at pembrolizumab plus chemo versus extreme. And this is in a population where the CPS score was at least 20. So I want to back up for a moment. At ESMO last year, uh, the authors were able to demonstrate with that second interim analysis that PEMBRO plus chemo was better than extreme and that PEMBRO was at least non-inferior to extreme. So now with this ASCO presentation, they're looking specifically at survival with respect to CPS scores. So in a CPS at least 20 population, PEMBRO plus chemo was superior to extreme both uh, with respect to survival. And this looks at not only survival at 12 months, but even the further you get out, PEMBRO plus chemo is superior with a hazard ratio of 0 0.6. When they looked at it for folks with CPS scores of at least one, same thing. PEMBRO plus chemo still was superior to the extreme regimen. And it's probably a little challenging to see here, but this is looking at response summaries. So respective, irrespective of the CPS score, when you look at overall response rates, those weren't really different with the Pembro plus chemo versus extreme. But as you can imagine, when you have immunotherapy involved, the duration of response is going to be better. And that's highlighted. That's highlighted below here. Duration of response is better, even if the response rates are not necessarily different. 
Now we're looking at pembrolizumab alone, versus monotherapy versus extreme. And this is looking at overall survival in the population with CPS greater than at least 20. And what you can see here is that, again, pembrolizumab did better with respect to overall survival. And again, in the CPS at least one group, you can see the same thing again. Pembro monotherapy is better from a survival perspective, overall survival advantage than extreme. And then this is the response summary looking at pembrolizumab versus extreme. What's important to note here is that this is the total population, so this includes the non pdl one expressors. And the extreme regimen actually has a better response rate. Um, but in those who responded to immunotherapy, again, the duration of response was longer. So this is a summary slide of all of the previous slides I just showed you to highlight <clears throat> for both pembrolizumab plus extreme versus extreme or pembro plus chemo versus extreme, how it panned out. And while neither of the immunotherapy arms had a benefit as it pertains to response rate or PFS, what was important was the overall survival. Pembro plus chemo, so this column here, was superior to extreme for overall survival in the total population as well as those who had CPS of at least one or at least 20. When you look at pembrolizumab monotherapy versus extreme, it was superior for our PDL1 expressors. It was non-inferior, not superior, but not non inferior, but it was non-inferior um, in the total population. So what did what came of these findings? Well, it was a practice changer. So effective June 11th uh, of this year, the FDA approved both of these for first-line recurrent metastatic disease. So all patients who are fit to receive it can get pembrolizumab plus chemo. Um, for patients who are pdl one expressors, uh, pembrolizumab monotherapy is also approved. So there are some outstanding questions related to these recent approvals. What do we do with our patients who have a poor performance status or don't have pdl one expression? Um, those had a better response if they got chemo first, so should we stick with the prior indications that existed? The other question is, can pembrolizumab be combined with other chemotherapy? So in this keynote trial, patients who got the pembrolizumab with chemo got platinum plus 5-FU. Now that might be a common regimen outside of the United States, but many practitioners here do not use platinum 5-FU. Oftentimes we do platinum plus taxane to get away from the 5-FU component. So what does this mean for those of us who aren't really using 5-FU to begin with? And then how do we decide between pembrolizumab monotherapy versus in combination with chemotherapy? And I think many practitioners are gonna look at whether the patient is really symptomatic and would really benefit from having combination therapy versus starting with monotherapy alone. So there are a number of questions that still need to be uh, addressed. But nevertheless, we now have another uh, first-line treatment that does not involve the extreme regimen. And these are just the guidelines for you to see. They've already been updated. So first line, and these are both extreme. This is pembrolizumab plus platinum 5-FU. And then under this column here, pembrolizumab for pdl one positive tumors as monotherapy. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch to the noteworthy negative studies. And this is primarily looking at two different targets. So CTLA-4 blockade and CDK-4-6 inhibition. So with the CTLA-4, we have the BIRD studies, um, one of our pharmaceutical companies loves to call their trials by birds. So we have Condor and Eagle, and then we have Checkmate, all of which are gonna be negative. And then looking at CDK4-6, we have a trial um, looking at palbociclib, which unfortunately did not pan out as we had hoped. So in the Condor study, this was a phase two for platinum-resistant patients 
who were not PDL1 expressors or had low expression. And they were randomized to either get Dervalumab plus Tremi, Derva alone, or Tremi alone. And the primary endpoint was response rate. And what you can see that I've highlighted here in the red is that the combination therapy had no advantage. What's not presented here was the toxicity data, which showed that the combo was worse as it pertained to toxicity. The other thing to note was that tremilimumab had no activity. So dervalumab was really um, emerged as being sufficient as monotherapy. So then there was a phase three trial completed, which is the EAGLE study. And this, again, was looking at dervalumab alone or derva plus tremi um, compared with standard of care. And this is, again, in second-line treatment. Standard of care was investigator's choice and was really single-agent cytotoxic or approved targeted therapy. Crossover was not permitted. And what we learned here, again, is that the overall survival for the combination was no better than the overall survival for dervalumab alone, which was really not better than standard of care. And then this is looking at survival. So this is an example of we have a negative study, but we go down that rabbit hole. So median over, overall survival, no advantage. Uh, it was When it, that was presented, it was also said, we'll see what the long-term survival shows. And guess what? Those curves don't separate either. So this again shows that the combination of CTLA-4 plus um, PDL1 really does not have an advantage over PDL1 alone. So when these results emerged or initially emerged, the thought was maybe tremilimumab is just not a good drug in head and neck cancer. What about ipilimumab? Ipi is often used in other uh, disease sites, so maybe that's the better option. Unfortunately, there was a press release in April of this year which showed in the first line recurrent metastatic setting that the addition of ipi to nevo did not have any benefit from a response perspective compared to nevo alone. So at this point, the door is a bit closed on looking at CTLA-4 blockers um, in head and neck cancer. Switching gears to CDK4-6 inhibition, so this was a phase two trial that looked at the combination of palbociclib with cetuximab versus cetuximab alone in an HPV negative population who had already failed uh, or progressed after platinum. This study was informed by promising phase one data as well as a single institution phase two study that showed an early efficacy signal with the combination. Unfortunately, the results were also negative. Um, there was no statistically significant difference in overall survival when you added a CDK4-6 inhibitor to cetuximab. So though that drug still seems to be most relevant for breast cancer, uh, not necessarily panning out in head and neck. Okay, so now I, in my last six and a half minutes or so, I'm gonna switch gears. Um, we're gonna now talk about salivary gland cancer. So adotrastuzumab and tansine. Most of you will formerly know this as TDM1, and I wish they would have kept that name. It's much easier. Um, nevertheless, uh, this antibody drug conjugate was looked at in a phase two basket trial in patients with HER2 amplified salivary gland cancers. While HER2 amplification is not that prevalent when you look at all salivary gland cancers, it is present in about 30% of salivary duct carcinomas. So this is um, certainly worthwhile to look at. In this phase two trial, uh, you, there was a cohort that included salivary gland that was over here. And if you had HER2 um, amplification, then you were eligible to get this therapy. I will point out that there were 10 patients enrolled in the cohort, including salivary gland. It took two years and two institutions to find 10 patients to put on this drug. Uh, 
But the results were pretty fantastic, even in a small population. This made it to the oral abstract session for ASCO. Um, what you can see is nine out of 10 patients had a response, um, and several of them had complete responses. And then when you look at progression-free survival, what you can see is at a median follow-up of 12 months, the median duration of response and the median PFS had not been reached. So one might say, well, this is great, but it's only 10 patients, so where do we go from here? The reality is, is when you have a rare cancer, it's going to be very challenging to be doing randomized trials and uh, trying to find those patients. As I mentioned, it took two years and two institutions to find 10. So certainly this is a signal that we think is very promising, um, and hopefully we'll have more data that could expedite this being an option for, for those, those patients, particularly since their treatment options are limited and their survival is dismal. Okay, so now moving on to nasopharynx. So there were two uh, large randomized trials presented at the oral abstract session this year at ASCO, both from our Asian colleagues who can impressively accrue patients um, and find them uh, in Southeast uh, Asia. And so the first study was looking at induction chemotherapy with a gemcitabine cisplatin regimen. Um, and these are the, this is the trial schema. So this included stage three through four B nasopharynx cancer, EBV mediated, had to exclude, uh, they did exclude T3, T4, N zeros. So patients were either randomized to get the control arm, which is concurrent chemo radiation with bolus cisplatin every three weeks for three cycles, or the experimental arm, which included gemcitabine one gram per meter squared on days one and eight, as well as cisplatin, 80 milligrams per meter squared, uh, every three weeks for three cycles of induction, followed by the standard concurrent chemo RADS arm. And what they saw with their primary endpoint of failure-free survival is that there was a 47% risk reduction of disease failure or death in those individuals who got induction chemotherapy. The second study was looking at induction chemo followed by concurrent chemo RADS versus concurrent chemo RADS, and this was actually long-term results of a prior uh, presentation. And so in this study, uh, patients received either the standard concurrent chemo RADS or they got induction for two cycles. Now this is with um, platinum and 5-FU, followed by concurrent chemo radiation with bolus cisplatin. And what they showed here was that, again, overall survival was better when patients had induction chemotherapy. Now, interestingly, in both studies, the toxicity was not that different based on whether or not you got induction chemotherapy. Um, I think it would be very difficult to accrue patients to those studies here based on numbers, but also to not see uh, significant toxicity changes. But our Asian colleagues were able to demonstrate that an induction approach is beneficial to just standard concurrent chemo radiation. So was this practice changing? Yes and no. Yes in the sense that it highlighted, it doesn't really matter what induction regimen you use in these patients. So you can use TPF, you can use PF, or you can use cisplatin gem, and any of those induction regimens, if you're giving it, you will still see better survival than just doing concurrent chemo RADS alone. The no part of it is really when you look at our NCCN guidelines. So our Asian colleagues have really moved towards using an induction followed by concurrent chemo RADS approach that hasn't quite picked up as much in the US. Um, certainly an induction approach was considered category three a couple of years ago. It's now been moved to a category 2A, but there's still a lot of practitioners who are doing uh, chemo RADS followed by adjuvant, or they're just doing chemo, concurrent chemo RADS without an induction or an adjuvant approach. So in terms of applicability and where we go from here, still hard to know. But if you are going to utilize an induction regimen, um, I think you can rest assured in knowing that you have some options for what you use. It does not necessarily have to be TPF. Okay, so back to the questions. <clears throat> 
Um, so back to question one. This is the gentleman with the HPV tonsil cancer that you are gonna give chemo rads. Um, what radio sensitizer would you add? So how many folks are gonna go with bolus cisplatin? Okay, is anyone going to say yes to cetuximab? Good. Anyone think that you shouldn't add a radio sensitizer or that the drugs are interchangeable? Great, so you listened to what we were, I mentioned and I was effective in conveying it. Um, bolus cisplatin is the, the winner here. So please do not de-intensify these patients outside of a clinical trial because it does impact survival. The second question is regarding what you would give as first line treatment for patients with metastatic disease who are PDL1 expressors. And I'm just gonna cut to the punchline here. Pembrolizumab monotherapy or Pembro plus chemo are now considered first line options that you can consider. This is my last slide. Um, so take home messages, cisplatin is the clear winner as preferred radio sensitizer. Pembro monotherapy or Pembro plus chemo are now first line uh, considerations for metastatic disease. Inhibitors of CTLA-4 or CDK-4-6 do not seem to confer any benefit at this time in the recurrent metastatic setting. Adotrastuzumab emtanzime represents a very promising therapy for our HER2 amplified salivary gland carcinomas. And then finally, if you're going to consider induction for uh, EBV-mediated nasopharynx cancer, cis plus gem is an, a considered an acceptable regimen. And with that, I will close. Thank you. We'll have a chance to ask questions at the end. And